You're listening to Glove Up or Shut Up on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. You're listening to Glove Up or Shut Up on AngryMarks.com with Peter H. and Stevie J. Find them on Twitter at HardcoreCBN and at Angry Marks. And now, for all the news, reviews, and interviews in mixed martial arts, it's time for Glove Up or Shut Up from AngryMarks.com. And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Glove Up or Shut Up, right here at AngryMarks.com. My name is Peter H., and I'm joined once again by my co-host from Omaha, Nebraska, Stevie J. Always a pleasure to be here with you, Peter, talking about all the things in the world of mixed martial arts. Absolutely. We've got a UFC show this past weekend. We don't have any shows this current weekend. we got lots of news. But I do want to start the show with something... That is being reported last couple of days, and that is the Cyborg Rousey saga. It looks like we might have something here now. Am I seeing this correctly? You know what? I'm with Dave Meltzer on this one. He addressed this on one of the last Observer radios, and Mm -hmm. he said what I've been saying on this show for months and seemingly years now. I Mm -hmm. don't care until the fight is signed. It. They, she can say what she wants, Rousey can say what Rousey wants, until she cuts the weight and makes 135, there's no point in believing a Cyborg-Rousey fight is ever going to happen. There was a lot of speculation involving the Twitter of Cyborg, plus Tito Ortiz, who last time I checked wasn't involved with Cyborg anymore. I but think still, they're still friends. I think they're, they're still, still friends? Yeah, they're still mutually acquainted. Okay, there was something with the manager of Cyborg talking to UFC, Dana White's denying it. It's a hole where there's smoke, there's fire. I think there's something here, but we don't have enough details this week to really delve into the possibility. But could you see Rousey versus Cyborg at the Dallas AT&T Stadium uh, co-maining with the Conor McGregor-Jose Aldo fight? I, I don't even think we're getting a show at the AT&T. I believe the show that they were talking about putting there has actually been moved to the MGM Grand. Oh, they're going to put the Rousey fight in Vegas now? Yeah, that's the last update I saw. Huh. Okay. Well, I mean, it won't sell as many tickets, that's for sure, because it could sell at the MGM Grand three or four times in AT&T Stadium. Yeah, but it actually turns out to be more profitable because they can charge higher ticket prices. That's true. If they if they if the fight does happen with with uh, Cyborg and Rousey, they put it in Vegas. They can charge very high top dollar for those tickets, especially cage side. That'd be ridiculous. Peter, they can put Rousey versus anybody. It really doesn't matter, especially if they've got McGregor and Aldo on the same card. They could charge anything they want, as long as Rousey and some combination of bantamweight plus McGregor and Aldo, they they got mm-hmm. a money making pay per view. They got a million buys for that. They got whatever ticket price they want. If I was a fighter, I would try to politic my way onto that card on like the undercard. Hell, I'd even fight on the fight pass if they, they let me on the fight pass. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, filthy like, Tom Lawler on line two. He'll probably want to be on that card. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we did have a show this past week in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it was a fight night with the main event of Glover Tessera against OSP. Hometown hero OSP. They were playing that Rocky Hilltop song for him as he came out. No, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't get what they wanted. They almost got what they wanted because he came out and tried to make it a brawl in the first round and Glover, Glover pretty good, but Glover recovered and started hitting those takedowns, and even though his yeah. face looked like a mess, he was winning the war in the wrestling department. I like that nickname, Clubber Glover. Clubber Glover. Well, he actually turned into that in the second round. When they were trading again, Glover started getting the better of it, and then by the third round, he had pretty much worn OSB out, which I heard several people make that prediction, like, OSP is strong, OSP can hit really hard, and OSP will win if it goes quick, but if he drags him into the deep water, Glover could overwhelm him, and that's exactly what happened in the third round. He choked him out. Which is uh, bad news if you're in that weight division, because a pissed-off Glover, you know, who can go the distance and has 
the punching power in both hands and has the he can fall back onto a submission strategy as well. That's pretty lethal. Yeah, this is the Glover of old. This is the Glover that came in to face John Jones. This is the guy yeah. that everybody thought had the potential to be the next light heavyweight champion. He looked like it in this fight. Now, what did Glover say in the post fight? Oh, I don't even remember at this point. This is days after that show. Basically, he said, Cormier, I'm coming for you. Yeah. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. <laughs> he might as well say that. I mean, he got as far as Jones and couldn't get past him, but he might think he has a better chance with Cormier now. I wonder if Glover would have to go through Rumble to get to Cormier. I'm not even going to play out those scenarios right now. Let's go ahead and talk about the rest of the card. Yeah, there's too many scenarios in that light heavyweight division. I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, Benil Darush against Michael Johnson. Darush wins. Uh, By robbery. Yeah, this is one of those fights where you watch it ten times, you're going to have five to five or at worst six to four no, for Darush here. No, no, I think nine out of ten times I would pick Michael Johnson to win this fight. Really? Yeah, the... Two of those judges scored the second and the third round for Dariush. The only round I would give Dariush is the third, and it's not like he was... Uh, I, let's put it this way. He might have looked like the aggressor, but every time he was coming forward, Johnson was clobbering him with combos over and over again. As a counter-striker, Johnson was eating him alive. So the fans were booing. I was left in shock. Nobody who works in UFC is like Michael Johnson lost his fight. They're treating him like he won. So what do you do with this? Do you, do you rematch the fight? Do you basically forget it happened and have no consequence for Johnson technically having a loss in this fight? I mean, what do you do here? Well, obviously it does affect the momentum towards working toward a lightweight title shot. But I still think you can book Johnson as one of the top prospects of the division and more or less ignore this. And for Darius, it's obviously the best thing that could happen because it gets him a win over a quality opponent, even if it's a tainted win. So he can put that in the bank and try to build momentum off of it. Derek Brunson defeated Sam Alvey in the first round at 2 minutes and 19 seconds. Now, do you think this was too quick of a stoppage? I know, yeah. I know I don't normally ask you that, but in this one, I kind of wondered. Yeah, I do. Yeah, Alvey was not finished. He was getting hurt, but he was covering up and protecting pretty well, and he didn't look rocked when he stood up. He wasn't wobbling around or anything. No, and he's got a jaw. He's got a like, granite iron cast jaw where it would take a lot to knock him out. Not like some other fighters we've seen where it's like one shot and they're already on the canvas. I mean, to me, the definition of a technical knockout should be you're not defending yourself and you're unable to, you know, properly respond when the referee stops the fight. Uh, Alvi was immediately up, was totally responsive, and was arguing he was not shaky, he did not look rocked. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying, let me just add one more thing, Peter. I'm not saying that this would have changed the outcome of the fight because I do believe Derek Brunson would have eventually pounded it out. I just think he needed a few more seconds to make it convincing. Mm-hmm. Well, it, if you do rematch these two guys, maybe you put a different ref in there. You know what? We're going to have to stop blaming the referees for this kind of thing at some point. It is a combat sport, and even if we don't like the decisions, they're there to protect the fighters. So They are. They are. Jared Rosholt beat Timothy Johnson uh, via unanimous decision. So Yeah, it's pretty much a wrestling match for the first two rounds, and then in the third, Tim Johnson made a very late comeback, and he actually started rocking Rosholt, but yeah. couldn't hurt him big enough to drop him and finish him, so too little, too late. The one thing, I mean, I shrugged my shoulders at this fight. However, that that flurry in the third, I'm thinking, where was this in the first and second round? Yeah, somebody lit a fire under him between rounds. And maybe even waved some smelling salt under his nose and said, you go out there and you dump your energy tank and you give it everything. And uh, God bless the guy, he tried. 
Amanda Nunez beat Sarah McMahon in the very first round at 253 with a rear naked choke. So does that mean McMahon is that not drops considered her to elite? The back of the line, yeah. She yeah. was talking about getting a Ronda Rousey title shot, and she is way far away from that now because Nunez torched her. I don't yeah. have any better word for it than that. She came out, rocked her, choked her, finished her, and totally overwhelmed her. This this was Amanda Nunez making a statement. Yeah, that's a statement fight for sure, and Nunez, you know, she's definitely in line. I mean, there's a huge line in front of her, but, I mean, she maintains a spot or maybe jumps up a couple of places, but... Actually, she jumps up three places to number four. She she and Sarah McMahon basically traded spots. Okay, fair enough. But, I mean, Rousey's downs card is pretty full of these days, so... Yeah, she's still got another match with Misha Tate, and... Then Zingano and Davis on line two, so. Yeah. She's in the mix, though. She's now right up there. And Ray Borg just destroyed Gene Herrera 30-27. Yep. Straight unanimous. In the prelims, uh, we did talk about this last week. Uriah Hall beat Ula Bangabos in the first round at 232. Yeah, finally looked like the killer he used to be on the Ultimate Fighter. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Chris Camozzi beat Tom Watson with unanimous decision. Yeah, uh, good performance for him. And at flyweight, Dustin Ortiz beat it. Willie, I got eight kids to feed Gates. Jeez. Oh, you said that last week, too. <laughs> it, it is forever going to be his gimmick now. Oh, man. I mean, honestly, if you're a prelim fighter and you got some need to be recognized by the public, say something like that that we'll never forget. There you go. Make us uh, keep the keep you in our public conscience when we need someone for a prelim fight, I guess. Exactly. Anything else on the prelims you want to talk about here? Yeah, Frankie, blinded by science, beat Sirwan Kakai, split decision, 28-29, and two judges saw it 30-27 in his favor. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I thought science was the winner here. What about uh, on the fight pass? Uh, one of the fights I did want to mention was Jonathan Wilson knocking out Chris Dempsey in 50 seconds. 50 seconds flat, yeah. Very impressive performance for Wilson. And uh, bad news for Dempsey. I, yeah. I, I mean, you're already we, – we say this all the time, Peter, and people probably get tired of it, so I apologize to our listeners. But if you lose on the fight pass – you're going nowhere fast. You could wind up being cut. And uh, Dempsey had already lost two of his last three fights, so that might be curtain call for him. Sad to say, but I'm sure another promotion is, you know, itching for some new talent, right? So Absolutely. So we don't have any shows this week coming up, so we got a little bit of a reprieve. The next show it looks to be in... Uh, in Canada here, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, at the fight night. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. So, nice to just sit back and relax, isn't it, for a week or two? It is. We need a little break, and heck, I need it because I'm spending so much time interviewing fighters. So, got to <laughs> keep my schedule clear and not be doing UFC all the time. Oh, man. Well, uh, we, by the way, was, uh, can, I, can I give a little teaser for yesterday's interview? Sure. I know I can't release it yet because the article hasn't been published yet on MMA Mania, but let me just tell all of you listening right now that if you want to hear a life story, not just a fighter talking about a fight, but somebody who has really been through some shit, you're going to want to listen to AJ Matthews. You're going to want to read the article that I wrote about him. This guy, he literally changed his whole life before his next Bellator fight, and it's pretty awesome and pretty commendable. That's all I'm going to say about it right now. Oh man! Well, I, I mean, I, I saw what, what was posted about it already, and it's interesting enough, and I'm looking forward to hearing it for sure. Yeah, he's got a very tough fight coming up against Emiliano Sordi, and I know it's on Spike.com. So I'm going to encourage everybody on August 28th to get in front of their laptop, get their Chromecast, get whatever going they need to do, and watch that fight. Well, let's go to the news, and the first one is about um, the light heavyweight champ, Daniel Cormier. He does not recognize Glover Tessera as a threat, saying, quote, what's he going to do? Well, you know what? Cormier should be brimming with confidence right now. Whether you yeah. call him the interim champion or the light heavyweight champion because you feel that John Jones is still the uncrowned because he never lost it, 
You call him whatever you want to, but right now, he's the man wearing the belt. He proved it in the fight with Rumble Johnson, and as long as he's still got those wrestling credentials and some good power in his hands, he's a tough mountain for anybody to climb. We talked about this last week, and one of the hearings from the Nevada State Athletic Commission looks like there's going to be a delay with Nick Diaz. Apparently, there's been a conflict with the attorneys, so the Diaz hearing is delayed. Uh, Shogun wants to have a rematch against Rampage Jackson. Well, that could be interesting. I mean, Shogun's coming off a win and got a little momentum again, but I'll say what I said before we previewed that fight. I feel like Shogun's closer to retirement than relevance. We did talk about Aldo and McGregor fighting. Uh, the date is actually official. It will be in Vegas December the 12th. Yep, MGM Grand. Oh. So that's pretty good. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, we talked about Saskatoon, and there was an interesting fight on the co-main event. Uh, Neil Magny is stepping in for Rick Story, who had to withdraw due to an injury. It'll now be Neil Magny against Eric Silva, co-main event. That's a pretty damn good fight. And Silva, I think people might have forgotten, but he is the guy that had one of the most awesome wars with Matt Brown that I've ever watched. That was a three-round fight for the ages. Yeah. There's something else in my news uh, before my close my news list here. Uh, two notes. It looks like November the 15th is the official date for the Robbie Lawler-Carlos Condit welterweight title fight. It'll be in Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, I'm kind of intrigued that they're putting a Robbie Lawler title defense in Melbourne. I didn't realize he was such a huge draw in Australia, but if he is, that's fantastic. And with the time difference, it'll be on November 14th here in North America. Indeed it will. And one other note, UFC 192 in Houston, Texas on October the 3rd, a top contenders fight between Tyrone Woodley and Johnny Hendricks. That will definitely shake up the division for a future contender. That is a war just just waiting to happen. Like that if that doesn't win fight of the night, I will be very, very surprised. I'll be very, very disappointed if Hendricks doesn't win, because I want that third Hendricks Lawler fight. Did you hear about Marlon Vera? What about Marlon Vera? He's well, he won his fight at the fight night this past week. And, uh, yeah, apparently against Roman he's fighting, Salazar with a uh, triangle armbar. He's fighting to pay off his daughter's surgery. Oh, my. Well, uh, what surgery is she having? Uh, just give me a sec. I have that on here somewhere. It's just, you, you hear stories once in a while, like the Miller brothers, something like that, where they're fighting for an ulterior motive. You know what right, I mean? Right, so, yeah. it's not the first time we've heard of this. Um, she suffers from Mobius syndrome, a rare neurological disorder that leaves a person unable to smile. Wow. Okay, well, props to him for uh, winning the fight and raising some money for his daughter. And maybe UFC can give him a little extra bonus money that's not listed on the payroll sheet. You know, they could they could help him out with that. That was his first UFC win, and there's a quote here saying... I'm training every single day of my life. I make a lot of sacrifices, but I'm here for that. I put on a show for the fans. The fans, they're paying for something. This is for me, for my family, and for all the Ecuadorians who believe in me. Ecuadorians. Yep, representing Ecuador. Good for him. So it's good to see that. And I mean, your first UFC win is a pretty big, but this is like the cherry on the top. You know, like, there's definitely a no, noble purpose there. So Right, and this is where I'm saying, you know, Dana White has been criticized a lot for the things he said on Twitter, for the public image he often presents. He's very brash. He's very confrontational. He's very profane at times. But I would say that if you read the other stuff that's written about Dana White, the stuff that's not as often widely reported, he does get the reputation of having a heart of gold of giving homeless people $100 bills just because he can. So if he really wants to be the nice guy, it may not get reported like when he's nasty, but he could do something extra here and really, really help this guy out. Somebody asked me this past uh, weekend, were you surprised that Jake Shields got suspended? Why would you be surprised? Both They both acted like idiots. I mean... The eye gouging and holding the Kimura too long, that was pretty obvious. But Jake Shields taking a poke at him after the fight, 
he should have held his temper a little better. He acted like an idiot too. Yeah, it's. I said. I said in a response. Basically, if he didn't throw that punch after the fight was over, he wouldn't have been suspended. It was just that one second of anger and more just screw you, buddy type of thing. Where it's like, you know what? No. And honestly, he's been in this game for so long now. There really isn't an excuse for doing that. It's yeah. It's not like he's a rookie. It's not like it's his first go around. Uh, there's talk about Donald Cerrone going to 170. Okay, why? Because he's getting tired of not getting his title shot, or what's the he's reason there? Losing patience with Dos Anjos. Yeah, well, you know, it's weird for Donald Cerrone to sit on the sidelines. This guy takes a fight every two months most of the time, so I'm sure he's itching at the trigger waiting to fire at any point now. I just, when I see that, it's like, I get what, I get why he's saying it, but if you put Cerrone in 170, there are a few fights there that would be great to see from a fan standpoint. Normally, I don't like the idea of people going up in weight class to take more fights. Like, I'm still against the idea for Benson Anderson, but let Mm -hmm. me just say that Donald Cerrone is a very tall, very lanky 155, so... If he went up to 170, he'd probably just get a little thicker, and he'd be right there in the mix. Well, I mean, there's a few people at the top of of that food chain there at 170 that, you know, hell, have Cerrone fight Benson at 170. What's the worst that could happen besides a great fight? Well, it's almost silly at that point. If you're putting two guys that used to be 155 against each other, what's, what's the real point? I mean... If you're going to have him move up to welterweight, do something interesting with it. Don't just put him against another former lightweight. It's more like, hey, you want to dance again there, Benson? Let's do this. Like, I don't think Cerrone would balk at a fight if it was, you know, given to him. No, no. I know he wouldn't. Donald Cerrone doesn't balk at any fight. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, if you, if he really wants to do this, make it interesting. Give him, like... Tiago Alves or Gunnar Nelson and see what he can do with a guy like that. Now, one last point here. Uh, there was a story this past week about the Culinary Union. They're trying to organize uh, a fighter union. And it's like, well... They're this just isn't screwing a... with UFC. There's nothing else to say. It's... <clears throat> well, UFC had a good... Uh, a good retort on uh, like a statement saying, you know, we treat our fighters well. They're very well paid, taken care of. Like, you know, there's no, you know, they, they basically are saying, you know, they're, they're fighting the points that the colony union is trying to bring up. And it's like, well, they're just screwing with UFC because they can, that they're trying to get the fighters to unionize and yeah. join in a work union. And the UFC fighters aren't going to be interested in that because they aren't going to go against Dana White. No, exactly, and it's it's a situation where is this is just a smoke screen or something to that effect because they already delayed the New York state legislation for another year, and now they're just trying to keep themselves busy. Like, I just, I'm tired of, I shouldn't say tired, but the Culinary Union, I think it's their mission or their mandate right now to really get the Fertitta brothers and Dana well, yeah, White in particular. They, they've been holding this grudge for many, many years now based on, for those who aren't aware of the Fertitas, the principal owners of Zufa, and the real power players, you know, behind Dana White, you know, Dana's the figurehead, and Dana makes a lot of decisions, and Dana has a lot of input, but he doesn't own the majority shares of Zufa slash UFC. The Fertitas do, and the Fertitas run a bunch of different casinos in Las Vegas, and the reason the culinary union is up in arms is because the Fertitas won't let any of the people that work in their food craft services and any of their hotels be part of the culinary union. It's like, you're either non-union or you're not with us. And the culinary union has been in fighting them tooth and nail for the years and years and years this has been going on, which is why they've screwed with UFC not getting legalized in New York. That's why they're proposing this fighters union. That's everything they do is to get even with the Fertitas. That's like you said, it's their sole mission in life. They, they don't even care about their culinary workers anymore. They've gone beyond that. This is now just petty. It, 
it it does strike me as petty. It does it does reek of that. It's just I don't see an end to this. Like there's no end game here. I mean, they're gonna keep trying and trying, like a little brother tapping you on the shoulder. Am I annoying you yet? Am I annoying you yet? Like we're not gonna see an end to this anytime soon. Hell, we're we're probably gonna be talking about this in 2016 and 2017 as well. The only way it's ever gonna end is if the Fertitta brothers give in and let the food workers in their hotels unionize, and I don't think they ever will. No, I mean, there's a better chance of, I don't know, Cerrone going to light heavy than that. I mean... You always like to break out the pro wrestling references on this short. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, what we have here is Hulk Hogan and Andre, Andre the Giant. The Giant. Yes. <laughs> An unstoppable force and an immovable object. That's There you done. go. Oh, man. Yeah, so, I mean... End of the day, it's not going to happen. They're just, they're just, you know, talking, and that's all they're doing is talking. The unions, they're just going to be bugging the Fertitas and Dana White for it till the cows come home. So, anyways, uh, we do have shows coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. We already talked about the show in Saskatoon, and I believe there was mention of the Paul Daly show. Uh, Paul Daly has an opponent now for the uh, kickboxing tent pole Bellator. Two ring, you know what I mean. It's right. It's it's the dynamite show that you're referring to, the one where it's going to be Glory Kickboxing and Bellator Mixed Martial Arts in two rings side by side at the SAP Center in San Jose. You going to go to the show or? No, I wasn't making plans to travel. The entire thing is going to be on TV for free. That's true. So uh... yes, what you're referring to is that. Both Paul Daly and Fernando Gonzalez will be having glory kickboxing fights on the same night as the rest of the Bellator main card. Well, it's going to be Bellator welterweights Paul Daly and Fernando Gonzalez. And there's a chance the winner could fight glory's welterweight champion, Nikki Holt. Holdskin. And right oh. now, the complete signed card for Bellator title fight with Liam McGeary defending the light heavyweight title against Tito Ortiz. A vacant glory light heavyweight title, Saul Cavallari versus Zach Mukesa, and a featherweight glory fight, Gabriel Varga defends his title against Surly Adamchuk, and the light heavyweight tournament that goes underneath the Bellator light heavyweight title fight. The first round pairings are Phil Davis, Emmanuel Newton, Linton Vassal, and Muhammad Lal. They just haven't told us who is facing who. And uh, yeah. the kickboxing fight, as mentioned, is Paul Daly and Fernando Gonzalez. That's September the 19th, so yes, coming up in just over a month, and... Get your tickets now. Absolutely. I just, I don't know, like, too, you know what I mean? I think it's too much, you know what I mean? Like, it's like the old World War Three thing with the two rings in there, the three rings in there, where it's like, yeah, I think it's too much for the enemy audience in North America to be, like, watching, like, a tennis match, you know what I mean? Where it's like, oh, look over here, now look over here. It's no, like... No, they're not going to be going on simultaneously. I hope not. They've never said that. They're they're setting up two cages, but they're not running two fights at the same time. This is not the three ring circus. Do you think this will be a one and done type of concept? I think if it works, they'll do it again. They're calling it Dynamite One, which means they expect there to be a Dynamite Two and Three somewhere down the line. I just I, I think it's too much too soon, but I mean Bellator seems to be going bigger and better with their shows, so yeah, they've got a vision for the future. They're signing a lot of talent. They're getting big-name fighters to headline big cards. So let them try this and see how it goes. Are they doing a send of a countdown special for the Mangiri Ortiz fight? I'm sure they will. It's Tito Ortiz. They'd almost have to. <laughs> Here, Tito, here's a microphone. Oh, I've never seen one of those before. Mm-hmm. Anyways. That's the news. All I've got on my list. Is there anything on your list that I neglected to mention today? No, I think that's everything. All right, well, what's on tap for Thursday night's AMP? I believe one of my co-hosts has booked a guest to talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, but I don't have that name in front of me, so tune in tomorrow night and find out who it was. Excellent. And uh, check out the other shows on the network as well. Uh, check all the shows out at angrymarks.com. And also, what is the YouTube channel? YouTube.com slash angrymarks.com. And hey, if you're going to subscribe to some things... Subscribe to our Twitter feeds as well. He's at Hardcore CDN. I'm at Angry Marks. Absolutely. And feel free to ask us questions. We'll answer them on the show. And 
And you, you know, I mean, it doesn't even have to be have... about mixed martial arts. You can ask us what our favorite kind of Campbell's soup is. I don't care. <laughs> All right. Well, for Stevie J, I'm Peter H., the Hardcore Canadian. Thanks for listening. And as I always say, never leave it to the judges. Good night, everybody. See ya.